Now, as we've been seeing early in the program, countries around the world are beginning to plan for how they'll safely bring tourists back after the coronavirus pandemic. In Barbados, borders remain shut, but the current daily curfew from 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. will be lifted next week as the government looks to reopen the economy. Well, Barbados has reported only 92 cases of COVID-19 and seven deaths, but the impact of the crisis on tourism has been massive. Well, let's go live to Bridgetown and talk to the country's Prime Minister, Mia Amor Motley, who's also chair of the Caribbean Community. Prime Minister, welcome here to our programme. When do you think you'll be able to open up to tourists again, Barbados and the other islands? Thank you, Matthew. We're not going to be driven by a date. We're going to be driven by protocols that make us safe because we want to remain safe for our people. We want to remain safe for people who are visiting us. And this is not only Barbados's position, but a number of countries within the Caribbean community. Um, and as you correctly stated, this has been a difficult moment for us all so that we are trying to balance lives and livelihoods like everywhere else. I listened to your reports earlier about Europe. We're in deep conversations with each other on a common public health protocol within the region. We're also having discussions with the airlines and the cruise industry. But we're not going to be driven by a date. We're going to be driven by a satisfaction that we have safe protocols that keep our workers safe, that keep our people safe, that keep our visitors safe. Just, just briefly on that, and I understand completely what you're saying, are you thinking, though, in your mind, weeks or, or potentially months here? Well, we all hope weeks, but we need to make sure that we touch all the bases. And to that extent, I think the airlines have been doing a reasonably good job in trying to ensure that the planes can be kept sanitized, certainly far more than they have been. But the big issue is testing and testing before people get on the planes um, or testing when people arrive. Quite frankly, it's more practical before people leave and we need access to rapid tests or test protocols that will allow us to be able to determine what is the risk that we are going to take if a person is tested 24 hours before, or should the person be tested within a matter of hours before going to check in. And what are the safeguards that you'll put in place? Will you accept tourists, for example, from high infection rate countries? What happens if you end up importing COVID-19, say, to, to resorts? I mean, in those sorts of questions, have you thought through what the answers are likely to be? That's exactly why, Matthew, I'm not giving you a date now. We are working through all of those protocols with all of the stakeholders. Up to this morning, I received a letter from the Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association as chair of CARICOM, and the individual countries are going to make sure that we touch all the bases because it is not our intention to import. It is not our intention to have anyone be affected. But at the same time, we have to balance the reality that the Caribbean is among the most travel, if not the most travel and trade dependent region in the world, yep. with 50% of our GDP effectively coming from it. Yeah, which means that there is such an imperative to get back to some sort of normal. Just right. how bad fact, has it been when it comes to employment, when it comes to, to government revenues? It's been bad. I mean, I think across the entire region, You've seen April will probably be a month where anywhere between 40 to 60 percent of government revenues have been affected in tourism dependent countries. Um, we've also recognized that the unemployment rates in most cases in countries um, that are tourism dependent have gone from double to treble in some instances. It's no different from what's happening in the UK and the US. The difference is, however, is that we have a much narrower base. And there are a number of countries that effectively depend on tourism. The only good news for us, as opposed to Europe, is that we've now come out of our winter season. And therefore, in a sense, we're going into our low season. Yep. But that, therefore, allows us to do some refurbishment and training and other things that we would otherwise um, have been looking at anyhow. But the scale of unemployment has been, has been crippling. Now, you were talking to the World Health Organization only last week. You've spoken about the need for global leadership, for moral That's leadership. Right. You want a fairer, more inclusive world order moving forward. Is that realistic, do you think, uh, in terms of what is likely to happen, given the, the sort of fragmentation we've seen in leadership over the last few months? It, it, it is imperative, whether we have it immediately or whether we have a long, torturous journey to it, we'll get it. And you only have to go back 100 years to look at the journey. I mean, we went through from 
1914 to 1918, a great war. We then had the Spanish flu um, for two years. Then you had the Great Depression at the end of the 1920s. In the region, we had our riots throughout the 1930s. And by 1939, you were into another great war. So there is nothing that guarantees prosperity or stability. But I do believe that the arc of history ultimately moves in that direction. Whether we are going to get there sooner rather than later, we pray and we will agitate for. Because we recognize that 75 years ago when the United Nations was formed and the Bretton Woods institutions, our countries were not independent countries. Yeah. Most of Africa was colonies. So we have to find a world order that better reflects the 200 nations of the world, that better reflects that one in every five is a small island state or a small state, and that better reflects that using historic per capita measures, um, in, uh, measurements to determine whether we should access any form of assistance in COVID-19 or post-COVID-19 is an arbitrary measurement that is as useless as taking blood pressure from two years ago to determine vulnerability to a stroke today. So let, let we me, keep using proxies that are not realistic to our existence. Let me quickly ask you two final questions, because people have pointed to Perfect. strong, decisive female leaders in this crisis, from Jacinda Ardern to uh, Angela Merkel. Is that just coincidence, or do you spot common traits? Well, I, I was asked that already, and I said that I fundamentally believe that the, the ability to care makes a lot of difference in terms of making the decisions that will ensure that we do not put our workers at risk, that we do not put our people at risk, that we do not put our environment at risk, because we are only here in trust for the next generation and the generation after. And we must not even look at COVID in a vacuum, because we are about to enter the hurricane season. We are in the middle of a climate crisis that's affecting us with drought and with sargassum weed. So you have to care about the implications yeah. for ordinary people and these things. And that must drive your decisions. I suppose That's the I suppose the opposite. Specific. I suppose the opposite of uh, perhaps what people have been pointed to is populism. Uh, a final thought: as a leader, how tempting is it to offer easy popular solutions in a crisis like this, and how much do you have to actually resist that? It always is, but you have to govern for tomorrow because tomorrow is coming. And if you only govern for today, then you will undermine the very ground on which you stand for tomorrow. So, look, we, we have to be sensible enough to know that we're in this for the long haul. The statement that I've told my people all the time is to stay focused. And once we stay focused on the mission, then it becomes that much easier to overcome it. We believe that we can... Yep have a meaningful life after COVID, but we have to protect what we do during it. Prime Minister, we've run out of time, but thank you so much for your thank time, you. for joining us here on BBC thank World you so much, Matthew. News. I hope to see you in Barbados sometime. <laughs> Hopefully soon. Uh, next up is Focus on Africa. I'm back in half an hour with more of the day's headlines. See you next time.